Hey, if you've got a Bible there, can you turn with me to James chapter 1? James chapter 1 this morning. I just want to float uh, an idea past you this morning. And uh, before I do, I want to share a story with you. Something that actually happened. What I'm about to tell you is a real story. Um, several years ago, uh, about the age of 19, I became a Christian at 19. Six months later, I joined this organization called Youth of the Mission, and they sort of scaled me and cleaned me up, you know, like when you catch the fish first, and, but you clean it after. You don't clean it before you catch it. So God caught me, and I went up there, and God did some amazing, wonderful things in my life. But I remember one day sitting around a table with the leaders of this uh, organization. The, the, I think the state director <coughs> was there, the base director was there, and they were having this conversation, and I just happened to be there. I, I had no input into it because I wasn't around at the time when this event happened. But they shared a story how some years back this guy had come out to Australia to do a training school with Youth with a Mission. He came into Brisbane and he was under the, the care of Youth with a Mission Brisbane. And so he got his visa from America, I think he was, came over. Anyway, at one point during the training school, he just kind of vanished. He just disappeared. He wasn't raptured. He just disappeared. He went. So he came over here to, to do this training school with YWAM and then all of a sudden he just kind of disappeared, which was a bit of a problem because he was here on a visa and, and as far as the government was concerned, kind of YWAM was, was where he was at and that's who was looking after him. So what happened was the school finished and <laughs> at the end of the uh, training school, of course, the, the, the YWAM uh, people had to be in correspondence with the government and uh, about the visa and say, look, this guy, uh, we don't know where he is because he'd overstayed his visa. He just decided not to leave the country. So here he is now coming over here to do a Christian training school and now he's overstayed his visa and he's basically an illegal immigrant in our country. And everyone's lost track of him. No one knows where he is, what he's doing. He's just vanished, just disappeared. Well, about 18 months, 12 to 18 months later, a bunch of the YWAM staff were sitting in the common area and there was a TV set there. Uh, remember when you used to have to get up and change the channels? On, anyone remember that? You used to change the channels on the TVs, not you just change it, actually move? Well, anyway, it was back one of those TV sets. And so one of the uh, members of staff got up and they were flicking through the channel to put something on. And it happened to fall on a show that many of you may still remember called Perfect Match. Anyone remember the show Perfect Match? Yep. Greg Evans plays God and he matches people up in relationships that probably lasted no more than about three minutes. But anyway, here's this show, Perfect Match, and as they flick onto it, the camera pans across to the three male contestants sitting on the chairs, and guess who was sitting in one of the chairs on Perfect Match? This man that was over here with YWAM, meant to be doing his uh, training school with YWAM, that had overstayed his visa, there he is, on perfect match, hoping that Greg Evans can do what Jesus himself was unable to do, help him find his perfect match. And so anyway, through a series of events, they ended up um, contacting the authorities. The authorities track him down. And then the YWAM leader goes to visit him. By this stage, he's in prison. He's been imprisoned for overstaying his visa, and I'm not sure if anything else happened, but here he is in prison. So the YWAM leader at the time goes to prison and gets an audience to sit down with him and sits down at a table. And here's what he said, the guy's reply was, he said, the minute I sat down with him, he looks up and he goes, well, praise God, now I know why Jesus put me in this prison so I could share the love of God with these prisoners. And he's looking going, no, you idiot. Jesus didn't put you in prison. A series of stupid events and choices put you in prison. Don't blame God. You ended up in a place of bondage, incarcerated, restricted, because you went and did your own thing. You weren't following Jesus. You're following your own desires. How many of you know people like that? You, we, 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 first of all, we want to blame everything on God. Now, here's the reality. God can take anything and use everything for the good of those that love him. That's the God that we serve. None of us are perfect, and none of us travel that journey 100% perfect all the time. So God is like a, 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 he makes the most of what we give him, uh, who we are, where we go, what we, he makes the most of it, right? But just because he makes the most of it doesn't mean that he puts you in that place in the first place. It just means that he'll make something good out of it anyway, even though your choices deserve something stupid. But God can still make something good. So here's this guy in prison, a place of bondage and restriction. And he's sitting there going, I'm here because this is where Jesus led me. Now, the truth of the matter is, it sounds funny, but the truth of the matter is, we all know in this place, Jesus didn't 
tell this believer in him to come to Australia and skip his visa. Jesus didn't say stay illegally in a foreign country. Jesus probably didn't say go on a TV show and see if Greg Evans can play me and hook you up with somebody. There's a whole series of things that happened along that journey that I'm fairly confident to say were not Jesus for that man. He wasn't being led by God. He was just being led by his own desires, being led by what he wanted. Let me ask you a question. What is it, how is it, that in your life and my life, we love God. Hands up if you love God. Hands up if you, 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 when you gave your life to Christ, you meant it. You, you want to go hard after God. You want what God has for you. You want to be the person he wants you to be. You want to do the things he wants you to do. You want to have the stuff he wants you to have. You want to achieve the things. That, that's, that's you. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say that, 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 that everyone in this room is in that place. Then how is it that even though we know where we want to go, what we want to do, who we want to be, how we want to live, we want to please God, how is it that we still do things that we know aren't pleasing to God, aren't helping us become who we're meant to become, aren't taking us to the place we need to go, aren't getting us to things God wants us to have? How is it that the devil can get us to go down these paths and not go down the path that deep down inside we really know that we want to? And, and, and the word that we use to describe that tactic of the devil is the word temptation. Temptation. The devil uses this thing called temptation to pull us in a direction and a path that we don't really want to go on. Isn't it interesting that how many times have you heard someone say this, the devil made me do it? Anyone ever heard that? The devil made me do it. Y y you know, the devil can't make you do anything unless you're possessed, of course, which happens. But did you know the devil can't make you do anything? All the devil can do is give you opportunity. He can create opportunity for you to respond, but he can't make you do anything. In James chapter 1, I want you to see what James says here. James chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. James says this. He said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Now, that word trial, in, in the New Testament, you can pretty much take the word trial uh, test temptation and interchange them most times that you read them. They're fairly linked. As a matter of fact, this exact Greek word here is translated uh, temptation in other uh, passages in the New Testament. So when you read the word test, trial, temptation, they're basically saying the same thing. Something is happening that's trying to pull you somewhere away from the place other than God wants you to be, to do something other than what God wants you to do, to be something other than God wants you to be. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial or temptation or testing. Because when he stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God never tempts us to go away from what he wants for us. That's not the character and nature of God. He never tempts us. Watch verse 14. But each one is tempted when by his... Whose? His own. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away. Say dragged away. He's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. And then he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Don't be deceived. Temptation is being dragged away. It says here that each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he's dragged away. That word dragged away is a, uh, a hunting, fishing term. And, and it literally means this. Are there any fishermen in the room here? There's no point saying hunters because I don't want to know if you are hunting. You shouldn't be doing it here. Um, not in Ganelabar anyway. Any fishermen here? Fisher women here? Any fisher people here? You want to be sexist? Fisher people. We've got a couple, okay? So, so here's, here's what happens when you go fishing, right? Anyone that fishes, this is, this is what you do. Usually a good fisherman knows what he's out to catch. Okay, he's got a bit of an awareness of the type of fish that he's trying to catch. And with his knowledge of that type of fish, he then strategically does a couple of things. He, he, he works out what's the right bait to use to catch that particular type of fish. Or if you're using a lure, what's the right colour lure, the right shape, the right type of lure that you're going to use. And then what he does is he goes to a certain place where that certain type of fish Habitate. Not every fish lives in every environment. So he goes to a place where he thinks it has the right kind of environment for that particular fish. And here's what he does. He, he puts the bait on or the lure on or whatever, 
And then what he'll do is he will cast his lure or his bait out into that space. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to get that fish that's probably undercover, that's probably in a place that's, that's safe for it. He's trying to get it to move towards that particular piece of bait or that particular lure. We're trying to get that fish to move from the place where it is to a place that's going to be bad for it, right on top of that bait or right on top of that lure. This is what the writer of James is, this is what James is saying. He's saying exactly that. He's saying that this is what happens when you are tempted. Satan takes a lure or a piece of bait and he throws it in your general direction. Now, he can't make you jump on it. He can't make you eat it. But what he will do is he will provide opportunity to try to drag you out from the safety of the place that you are meant to be sitting in or standing in. He'll try to drag you away from being the person you're meant to be. He'll try to drag you away to chase after the things that you're not meant to be chasing after. He'll try to drag you away to do stuff that you don't want to do. But here's the interesting thing. The devil can't make you do it, and the lure is not the problem. James tells us here what the real problem is when it comes to temptation. He says we're tempted when, by our own evil desire, we're dragged away and enticed. By our own evil desire... That word uh, desire there, it's, in, in the Greek, it doesn't talk so much about the object of the desire. It talks about the intensity of the passion. So what it's saying there is that you have a passion, a desire inside of you for something that's wrong. The actual word means something that's forbidden. You've got a desire in you for something that you know. You know you shouldn't be going after. You know you shouldn't want. You know, you, you know all the stuff, but there's a desire inside of you that still wants that particular thing. And so the devil comes along and he uses your weakness against you. He tries to entice you to go in a certain direction by setting up situations, circumstances, whatever it is that he can do to try to use what, 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 what I would term your weakness against you. He wants to exploit your weaknesses by using them against you. So I want you to have a think about that. Temptation's power is internal, it's not external. The power of temptation is not what's going on around me, it's what's inside of me. This is what James is saying. James is saying you can only be tempted by something that you already want. Does that make sense? You can only be tempted by something you want. That's why there are so many uh, things in life that you don't really struggle with. There's a lot of things you're not tempted by. And temptation is individual to each person because each person's journey has been individual. We have been scarred in different ways. We have been disappointed in different ways. We've been hurt in different ways. We've had things come against us in different ways. Every one of us are absolutely and totally unique. And so, for example, I could bring a, a, a bag of cocaine into this room and I could plop it down here in the middle of the floor and all of you could leave. And nobody could know it was there. But I can tell you right now, I would not be tempted in the slightest to go anywhere near that or touch it. It just would not tempt me. Now, maybe somebody else here in this room, maybe that might be a temptation to you. Maybe you might find that's something that, that you're enticed towards, that you, 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 would have a, you would want to go towards. But you know what? Maybe I might want to stand up here and embellish a story one Sunday morning to make myself look more spiritual. Maybe I might be tempted to do something like that, but I wouldn't be tempted to touch a drug. See, we're tempted because there are certain things on the inside of us that James calls them desires. There are certain desires that we have on the inside of us that still want to be in places where we shouldn't be. They still want to look at things that we don't want to look at, hear things we shouldn't be hearing, say things we shouldn't say, become somebody we, we, God doesn't want us to become, go to places that we're not meant to go, chase after things that God doesn't necessarily want us to have in our world, but there's something going on on the inside of me. And the devil tries to use that weakness against me by exploiting it. And that's where temptation comes from. Temptation comes from within me, not outside of me. There's something going on inside of me that the devil is smart enough to know that's, that's where I'm going to throw the lure. That's where I'm going to cast the bait and see if I can't just tempt that person out of that place. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. Every human being struggles with this thing called temptation. Every single human being. Because we've all had disappointments and hurts. We've all had things happen in our life. 
And not every desire that we have is in line with the desires that God wants. Amen? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to have a think about what is that biggest sort of temptation, that area in your world right now. Temptation in, in its simplest form is this. It's, it's, a, it's a pull towards anything other than God. It's a pull in your life towards something other than God. It's to be something other than the person God created you to be. To do something other than what God created you to do. To have something other than what God wants you to have. To go somewhere other than the direction that God wants you to head in your life. I want you to entertain me for a second and just for five, ten seconds, have a think about what's that area in your world where you know that that describes you. There's a pulling towards something. And maybe, it's, maybe you constantly fall. So many people, when it comes to temptation, it's like, you ever seen those hamsters on treadmills? They just keep going round and round and round. And we, we, we chase the other than God thing because we're tempted. When we get there, we realize it's empty. We feel bad because we know it was other than. It wasn't God. So we, we pray to God. We say sorry and so on. But then we go back and we do the same thing again. And we go back and we do the same thing again and the same thing again because there's this pulling, this pulling, this pulling. Did you know in the Bible it doesn't say anywhere to get a resist temptation? It doesn't say resist temptation. It says resist the devil. It doesn't say resist temptation. As a matter of fact, if you read the New Testament letters, anywhere where it looks like the writer could have potentially said resist temptation, he doesn't use the word resist, he says flee. In other words, don't even be in that environment. Flee sexual immorality. Do not put yourself in a position where you might be tempted. Why? Because if you already have that desire inside of you, guess what? The odds are stacked against you. Or am I the only person like that? When there's a desire in my heart for something, God would rather I fled from that place. Some people go, oh, I'm strong enough, I'm strong enough, I'll just put myself in that position. And we keep falling, keep falling, keep falling. Why? Because you, there's still a desire on the inside of us, right? Now, I want you to think about that desire. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a really sharp left-hand turn here. And I want to give you some good news. Here's the good news. You don't have to live in the cycle of temptation for the rest of your life. Because God does have an answer for us. Psalm 37 verse 4, it says this. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. What's the problem with temptation? How does the devil get his hook in there? It's because you have desires in your heart for things other than God. David writes in the Psalms and he says, but if you will delight yourself in God, here's what God does. When David says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, this is not what he's saying. He's not saying, if you just get all oh, happy about God and cheerful with God, he'll give you five cars, seven houses, a million dollars, the perfect life. It's not saying, delight yourself in God and he'll give you whatever desire that you want. Why do I know he's not saying that? Because there are so many desires in you and me that are not of God. We still have things that we desire. That's why we are tempted. If we didn't have a single desire to do a single thing wrong, the devil would walk away and go, I've been defeated in that person's life totally. Jesus defeated me, but they've, they've, they've walked out that victory now by being transformed and changed and conformed into the image of Christ. I can't get him, and he'd leave us alone. But he doesn't because he knows that we still have areas of weakness and areas of desire that are not conformed yet the way God wants them to be conformed. And so what God wants to do is not say, well, tough. You just got all these desires running around. So I can't do anything. I can't help you. God wants to change those desires. When, this, when, when, when David writes and he says, delight yourself in God, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Let me explain what that means. That word delight, it means this. It means be soft and be delicate, pliable in the hands of God. Are you soft and delicate and pliable in the hands of God? In other words, can God change you? Do you have an open heart to God to bring transformation to you? Do you have an open heart for God to come on in amongst the gunk and the junk? And the reason why that thing is so attractive. How many of you know the thing is never really the issue? Someone's bombing himself out on alcohol this morning. And we want to go, stop drinking, stop drinking, stop drinking. The drinking is probably not the issue. 
It's just the, 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 tree, the leaves on the tree. It's not the root issue. There are root issues behind the behaviors that people do. And so we want to bang on about change behavior, change behavior, change behavior, but you've still got a desire and you find yourself fighting a battle that you just can't win. What we need is God, change our hearts, Lord. Change the very desires that are on the inside of me so that I desire the things you want for me, not the things I want for me, not the things my culture wants for me, not the things my brokenness and weakness are crying out for to help cover them or help mollycoddle them, or help support them. God goes, I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, have things in there to support your weakness. See, the devil wants to exploit your weaknesses. God wants to heal your weaknesses. God wants to bring healing into those areas of our life. So here's the reality of it. That one area that you're thinking about, that you're saying, that's my greatest area of temptation. That's that thing that's pulling me away from being who God wants me to be. That's the thing that's pulling me away from doing what God wants me to do. That's the thing that's pulling me away from going in the direction of my life that God wants me to go. That's that thing. That thing you're thinking about that the devil keeps casting a lure at you for, that area that he's trying to exploit, that is your greatest area of potential growth. Right now. Right now, that... That temptation gives you an insight into your own heart. And guess what? The area of your greatest temptation is the opportunity for your greatest growth. Why is it? Why is it that you want that? So here's the thing. Most of us know what our temptations are. Yep. Most of us know what our temptations are, but we don't take time to think about why is that a temptation. See, what, 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 what David's saying here is if you delight yourself in God, if you make yourself soft and delicate, pliable in the hands of God, then what God does is God actually gives you the actual desires of your heart. In other words, he takes out the desires I have for all the things that I thought I wanted for my life. He removes the actual desire and he places within me an actual new desire. So all of a sudden, now I'm desiring the things that God wants. Now I'm wanting to be the person God wants me to be. Now I want to do the things he wants me to do because I have a desire for those things. So I can be led towards those things. And the enemy comes and he flicks his lure at me, but I don't have a desire for that anymore. So the temptation is weakened. It doesn't work anymore because I'm not tempted to go down that path because my very desires themselves have been changed. But God changes our desires by molding and shaping us. And the number one way that he molds and shapes us is he brings healing into our world. You know what I found with a lot of Christians? Knowing stuff about God is enough. But when God wants to get down to the nitty-gritty of our heart and change us as people, we put walls up. We resist God. I don't want to go there, God. It's too messy. I don't want to go there, God, because uh, it's too hard. I don't want to go there, God, because it brings up too many things. So guess what? Everything it's going to bring up is going to be leading you to healing. It's going to be leading you to wholeness. The devil wants to cast lures at you. He wants you to, 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 in those areas of your greatest temptations, what he wants you to do is to keep them quiet. Keep them to yourself. What would people think about you if they knew you struggled with that? What would people say about you? What opportunities would you lose? What doors would close? Who would not want to be your friend? In whose eyes would your estimate drop? Because if they knew that, but God's trying to say that area of your toughest temptation is the opportunity for your greatest growth. I want to get into that, and I want to work with you on that. I want you to talk to someone about that. I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight into why. Why do you, why do you resist being who I called you to be, and you try to look at another way? Why do you keep chasing after this lifestyle when you know I've got a lifestyle over here for you that's going to give you life and joy and peace? It's going to be great for you, but you persist over here. We don't want to let God into those places. Yet those areas of our greatest temptation, that is an indication to you that there's a weakness in there, there's a desire in there that's not been changed yet by God. And God says, but if you come to me, let me mold you let me shape you because I, I don't want you to resist temptation because i know it's so hard and it's draining and it's tiring 
and you keep losing. Why? Because at the very core of you, you still have a desire for that. So you're fighting against yourself. I want to change the very desires of your heart so that you start desiring the things that I have for you. Many of us know what our greatest temptations are, but we don't know why. We don't know why they're our greatest temptations. And most of the time, your greatest temptations are linked to some kind of hurt or disappointment, lack of, of, of self this or that. There are reasons why that thing is so attractive. And the thing is never really the issue. It's the reason why do I chase that thing? What does that thing give me? What do I perceive that thing meets inside of me that Jesus wants to meet? God wants to meet. Ask the why question. Why do I drink too much? Why do I still look at those pictures? I heard a guy say once the first second's not sin. You know, you can let a bird, you can, can't stop a bird landing on your hair, on your head, but you can stop him making a nest in your hair. Ever heard that saying? Flick on the TV and there it is, the first second's not sin, but the second second, why'd you hang around? Why'd you stay there? Why do I spend so much money when we don't have it? Why do I overeat or undereat? Why do I do it? It's leaving me in an empty place. It's not helping me become the person God wants me to become. There's a reason why I'm doing all these things. I know what I'm doing. What I've got to do is try to understand why, and God wants you to understand why. Why do you do these things? Why do I get so angry all the time? Why am I so impatient? Why do I find myself in the arms of so many different people? Why am I so intolerant of other people's imperfections? Why do I constantly judge those around me? Why do I constantly engage in gossip? Why do I have to let everybody know everything that I know just so they know I knew it? So I feel like I'm one of the group. I'm in, I knew something. I was important enough to know something before you. Why, why, why? You can fill in the blank. What is it about blank that's so attractive that I'll go against what I know to be right just to do it, just to have it, or just to be it? You see, Satan wants to use temptation to bring you down. That's his goal. And no temptation sees you except that which is common. We all struggle with temptation. The devil wants to use temptation to bring you down. God wants to use your temptation to grow you up. To grow you up. To help you become that person that he knows that you're, you're meant to be. To do the things that he wants you to do. To have the things in your world he wants you to have. But for many of us, we still got these desires for other things. And God wants to change those desires in your heart. Now, here's the thing. I can say all of this, and then we can get up and walk away from here and get on with life, and that's all fine, and that's what happens probably in you know, churches all around the world. A lot of Sundays, we get on with life, and we have our roast chicken and our buns and sandwiches. My prayer is this. That area of your greatest temptation, if you are sitting here now and you can think of an area and you know that's a struggle, then I want to put this to you, that the Holy Spirit wants you to actively do something about that. Sometimes we want someone to pray for us and that the world would go ping and we would be totally transformed and changed. And maybe that's the example of some people in this room. I got saved at 19, I'm still working through some of my junk, you know, 30 odd years later. So, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't just happen like that. Uh, sometimes we've got to do a little bit of work too. Sometimes we've got to open up and say, hey, excuse me, I've got this struggle, would you pray for me? Uh, hey, I've got this issue. I, 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 I'm, when I was a kid, this happened. don't know how to process it. Can I talk to you? Hey, I'm going to pick up this book and I'm going to actually spend some time and get into it and find out what verses can I find, what wisdom can I get out of here about that particular area that I'm struggling with. I'm going to do something to take some steps towards my own healing and know that the Holy Spirit meets you on that journey. He meets you on the way. I was talking to Dell yesterday she said something amazing and i don't hear it a lot these days i'll finish with this del said to me as i was in the hospital i, I sat down with her and i said del i've got an hour with you so why don't you tell me your whole story give me the long version of your life and your story and she did it's an amazing woman got an amazing story but she got to the point of when she gave her life to jesus and here's what she here's what she said 
She said, I went along to a Salvation Army church. And she, in her words, she said, there was something about those people that I looked at them and said, I have to have what they've got. I have to have what they've got. I, I often wonder whether in today's modern church world, we, we, we talk a talk, but do we walk a walk? Just a thought. We talk a big game. Jesus can transform and save and heal and you can trust him and so on. But when it comes to me trusting him, I'll only trust you with a certain thing. When it comes to my healing, well, I'll conceal my stuff. Well, I, I wonder, I wonder whether God, whether the Holy Spirit right now in, in, in the Western world didn't hit a reset button when we had COVID. And I think, I think there was a reset button here. And I know a lot of people time we're talking about the structures of the church and the way we do church and this is all got to change but here we are we're still sitting in buildings in chairs with a guy up the front with a microphone and a worship band we're doing the same thing we did and you know what i don't think god cares i just don't think god cares how we do it god's more concerned about who we are than how we do it who we are than how we do it are we a bunch of people that we just love the hype of it. We love the feeling of Jesus. We love the emotion of Jesus. We love the mountaintop experiences. Or are we people who actually go, you know what? Jesus Christ crucified, beaten, bled, buried, raised from the dead. In a time and a culture where he was not popular. The church was birthed in a time where it wasn't popular to love God. It wasn't popular to follow Jesus. It just wasn't. A lot like the kind of culture we're coming into now, isn't it? They don't like Jesus. They're not interested in our message. They're not interested in a lot of things to do with church. They're not going to come running into buildings. They're not, no, no, no. But when we leave this place, we're all going to splinter. And we're going to be like Jason Bournes, you know, the, out there in the world amongst them. And I just am challenged each day. Do I, do I take this stuff serious enough? that I'm just not wanting the good things from me. God, I want you to put your finger on those areas of my world where I'm not doing well. I want you, God, to challenge those desires. God, I want you to expose those weaknesses in me because I want to be more and more conformed into the image of Jesus so that one day somebody goes, you know how I came to faith? Because I was in that church, I was in that place, and I just saw those people and I knew I have to have what they've got. I have to have what Alan's got. Not a Bible, not a nice shirt, pretty wife, great kids, none of that. No, no, what's on the inside of him, whatever he's got, whatever's transformed him, whatever he loves that much, that he gives his all to it. I've got to have that. And, and, and I hope and pray that that's the story and the desire of everybody in this room here this morning. If you're visiting us today, you came on a bit of a heavy day. Every now and then we have these heavy days, you know. So they're not always heavy days, but I, I just, I just, I'm challenged by this notion that my greatest area of temptation is the opportunity for my greatest growth. One thing to know that now, what am I going to do with it? And what are you going to do with it? Lord, I just want to thank you for this morning. God, again, just thanks for the opportunity to gather, uh, God, in this place. It's, it's, it's amazing the freedoms and liberties that we have, God. And don't ever let us take them for granted. Don't ever let us take them for granted, Father. God, thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit here in this place right now in the hearts of everybody that's called upon your name everybody that's bowed their knee to you filled with your holy spirit thank you for that and lord i pray as we leave this place today that uh god would you would you raise up a boldness on the inside of us that god we're not happy to just be uh 70 whole god i want to be 100 percent whole Father, I want to do the business that you want me to do. God, I want to deal with those areas. I want to be pliable in your hands so that you can change the very desires of my heart, God, so I can desire what you want. God, I want to get to that place, Father, where I can pray and ask and believe and know because it's coming from a place of desire that's 100% pure and coming from a place where you want it to come from, Father. So, Lord, I pray for every person in this room as we leave here today. That, God, we would think about that. The, the area of our toughest temptation is the opportunity for our greatest growth. And, Lord, not only would we be aware of it, but we would do something. Talk to someone. 
pray, open up, seek help, pick up the Bible and have a look at what it has to say. But God, we would begin that journey toward healing and wholeness because, Father, we don't want to live in prisons. We don't want to live in bondage anymore in those areas of our life, Father. We want to be free and transparent and open to you and to all that you want to do in and through us, Father. And God, I also pray for each person in this room, God, as we leave this place. In the next seven days, God, would you give every single one of us, everyone in this room, give us an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Give us an opportunity to tell somebody out there that right now doesn't know how special they are to you, doesn't know that you love them, doesn't know that you died for them, doesn't understand, God, that you're calling them back. Father, give us a chance to bump into those people this week and tell those people about the goodness of God. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.